Thanks very much, Christina. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about tissue-specific genome-wide view of complex human disease and then how we can use uh, these very, very diverse uh, functional genomic data sets to be able to look at very specific questions uh, that are relevant to human disease. So how do we really go from this big genomic data and functional genomics data uh, to understanding what's going on in the molecular level in very specific, cellular specific situations? Um, and first, of course, what we need to understand is how do we go from the genome and a single change, a single nucleotide polymorphism in the genome to specific regulatory changes in the chromatin as well as which proteins are going to be expressed. Um, and so in a simple way is how does a single letter change in the genome affect chromatin and gene regulation? Uh, then what we want to do is be able to say, well, does this effect actually mean something in terms of human disease? Because, of course, there's a lot of these differences that are actually ha not going to have any disease level effect. Uh, and in other words, which SNPs uh, are actually functional and lead to complex human disease? Uh, and once we can actually understand which proteins are expressed in every tissue and cell lineage, and whether these proteins are actually linked to human disease, then can we actually understand how these proteins interact with each other in every specific tissue and cell lineage that is disease relevant? Uh, and we'll talk about that in terms of how different pathways and networks change in the brain, in particular parts of the brain, in the kidney, uh, in the liver, and how are they different? How are the functions and interactions of these proteins different across these different cell lineages and tissue types? Uh, and how can we understand it on the network level? And to be able to do that, of course, we want to be able to, be, to do this from often non-tissue specific or very heterogeneous, at least, data. Uh, and so that's what we will address. So to summarize, uh, we'll talk about a deep learning based uh, framework for being able to look at single nucleotide changes and their effects uh, on the chromatin as well as whether they will be able to be uh, ca disease causal. I will talk about a general method for making tissue specific networks from very noisy and heterogeneous data that is often non-tissue or cell lineage resolved. And finally, how we can use these networks to actually directly combine with quantitative genetics data to improve our ability to understand the molecular basis of human disease. So without further ado, let's talk about how do we go from the genome to understanding what is the regulatory effect of genomic changes. And we've developed a deep convolutional network-based method called DeepC uh, that we trained on uh, epigenomics data from uh, the Roadmap Epigenome Consortium and ENCODE. Uh, in being able to take de novo a genomic sequence and be able to predict a number of different chromatin marks, histone marks, transcription factor binding, and DNA's hypersensitivity, so DNA openness effects. The system is being able to do that with a single nucleotide sensitivity and without making any assumptions about where, what we know about transcription factor binding sites and other uh, prior literature. So it's completely data driven and we can generate models for over a hundred different cell types uh, that are present in these consortia and these models actually share features for more accurate uh, cell type specific prediction. Now that we have this prediction of given a new genome, a new patient genome, what does a known coding change actually mean in terms of genomic regulation and protein expression? Uh, we can actually use this to pre prioritize these functional variants as disease associated or not. And we can do that actually uh, in an unsupervised way, so co completely directly from these data, or we can actually train this based on known catalogs of disease associated SNPs. And of course, there's a question of how well does this work, and we can actually look at this across a number of different uh, holdout evaluations, so where we uh, hide a subset of the data from the system and then ask it to be able to predict uh, the answers to these uh, holdout hidden data sets across a number of different chromatin marks, prediction, uh, histone QTLs, et cetera. And we also can look at actually independent uh, experimental verifications on experimental, uh, independent experimental data sets, and I won't have time to go into that here, uh, but the system is actually quite accurate about predicting across a number here in the holdout shown a number of different chromatin marks, including being able to predict binding of uh, transcription factors, uh, DNA openness, as well as uh, uh, a very large number of chromatin mark prediction. Uh, and uh, this performance is actually robust across all of the 
different cell types. So each curve on these graphs is a single cell type. Uh, and furthermore, underrepresented cell types actually get quite a bit of a boost from this uh, what we call multitask learning approach. So that when the system is actually able to borrow information across the different cell types because it's learning across all of them. So furthermore, this accurate ability to predict epigenomic effects of single nucleotide change can actually be used to directly prioritize disease-associated SNPs. Uh, and these are three different evaluations looking at uh, whatever your favorite uh, disease SNP catalog is. Of course, the most uh, trustworthy in a way is the HEMD, disease mutations, which are curated disease mutations from the literature, which are known to be associated with disease. Uh, the other ones are, of course, uh, less uh, direct. Uh, so either GWAS, lid hits or EQTL studies, uh, but you can see that across all of those, our approach, which is uh, shown in orange, uh, outperforms all of the prior methods. And remember, this approach does not make any uh, biased assumptions about what are the known transcription factor regions uh, that it, it needed to train on. Uh, it's completely data-driven. So finally, let me give you an example of what an effect of our method as well as other methods like this can actually be. How can you actually use it in real life? So let's say you get a whole genome sequence from a patient. This is actually an example on something that has been found previously in the literature, but to show you how you can actually use this. You get a whole genome sequence from a patient. This particular patient has a T2C single nucleotide change in the intergenic region in front of their uh, globulin cluster. Uh, and there's a disease called alpha thalassemia, which usually is actually co uh, caused by issues with uh, uh, globulin function. But in this case, what happens is that uh, if we look at this T2C change in deep C, deep C predicts at a highly significant level very large increase uh, in GATA1 binding in the intergenic region next to alpha globulin. And it turns out that if you look at that, that GATA1 binding is actually causing increased intergenic expression which in turn causes decreased alpha globulin expression in that region. And that decreased alpha globulin de expression actually causes alpha thalassemia phenotype, in this case due to lack of alpha globulin expression as opposed to issues with the actual protein. So you can imagine that now, as more and more whole genome studies are starting to come out in different diseases, it's going to be more and more critical to be able to actually look, and especially in cell lineage and tissue specific way, at these non-coding changes uh, in these genomes to understand what effect they might have and whether they're actually functional, which ones that we need to follow up on experimentally. So if we can actually now take a non-coding change and understand which proteins are actually expressed uh, in a particular cell lineage and cell type in a patient, now can we actually start understanding how these proteins function changes and how their interactions change in different tissues and cell lineages. So of course, all of the pathways that we all know and love from different uh, biological databases and well as textbooks are generally not actually present in any particular cell lineage or cell type in the form that you've seen. This is really an aggregate on what we understand how cells do DNA damage repair and cell cycle control uh, and other critical functions, but all of those are actually somewhat different depending on whether you look at the podocyte cells of your kidney or the your brain cerebellum, or particular neuronal cell type. So can we actually take existing diverse functional genomic data that is often not resolved for even a tissue, and certainly not many of those cell lineages, and understand how this protein function actually changes across these tissues and cell types? This is, of course, an experimentally not a tractable problem, and is not going to be even in the next five or 10 years, even as uh, amazing technologies in single cell sequences come out because realistically we're not going to be able to measure the about 10 to the 8 pairs of protein interactions across every possible cell lineage in every possible genetic background, in every possible environmental background, at every possible point uh, or even some reasonable points in our developmental cycle. So we do need to think about how we can do this computationally to combine whatever cell lineage and tissue specific information we can get out of experiments. And uh, what we uh, have chosen to do is use diverse functional genomic data that's available. So this is, we basically collect thousands of uh, gene expression data sets, physical interaction data, information about shared transcription factors, basically anything you can think of that might tell us about when proteins are expressed, how they're interacting with each other, and how they're regulated. And the vast majority of this data in human is going to be gene expression data. So can we collect all of this data? Of course, most of it is not resolved to a particular cell lineage, 
Many of the cell lineages are not represented at all. So for example, the human podocytes, which are critical to study if you're interested in chronic kidney disease, we can't actually still isolate uh, in enough quantity in human to be able to assay in high throughput. So some of them, some of the really critical cell types and tissues won't have any data sets. And many will have very heterogeneous data. Most of the data is not labeled with a specific tissue. A lot of it is tissue culture. So how can we take all of this basically mess of big data and be able to extract highly tissue-specific signals about protein function and interactions. What we're going to use is basically a hook of hierarchically integrated tissue-specific knowledge, uh, and we're going to use a machine learning classifier to generate tissue-specific networks across a number of different tissues, in fact, 144 of them. Uh, we will be able to then use these networks to predict lineage-specific molecular response so for example, if we're interested in inflammation in blood vessels, which of course is critical if you're studying cardiovascular disease, we can look at cytokine IL-1 beta, an important moderator uh, of um, mediator of inflammatory response, and use our networks to actually predict which proteins are going to be perturbed by induction of IL-1 beta. And it turns out that actually, if you do transcriptional profiling of this cell type, uh, indeed, these networks predictions are correct, and they predict, uh, in this case, 18 out of 20 are uh, actually significantly change in transcriptional level right upon activation. The other two are actually non-transcriptionally regulated, but are indeed IL-1 beta interactors. And the blood vessel network is by far the most accurate one for predicting this response. So you really need the tissue-specific information to be able to do this correctly. And this holds across a number of different tissues uh, if you're interested in looking at IL-1 beta uh, induced inflammation. Finally, we can take these tissue-specific networks and combine them with genome-wide association study data to be able to combine the unbiased disease signal that the genome-wide association studies hold with the functional uh, network signal to be able to overcome the challenges in DWAS data uh, of low statistical strength due to epistasis, low frequency mutation, and small effect sizes. So to do that, we're going to take our genome-wide uh, association study data, which of course, basically, in terms of the coding genes, can allow us to prioritize coding genes in the order of the likelihood that they are associated, in this case, with hypertension. Now, even if the genome-wide association study doesn't have a single uh, genome-wide significant hit, the actual ranking should be enriched towards hypertension associated genes towards the top of that list. So we can take the top of the list of these associated genes and throw them onto the network and do this, of course, with a class, computational classifier. And we can take genes that are not prioritized by genome association studies and throw them onto the network as well. And the network, if it truly represents, in this case, kidney-specific molecular associations between proteins, so how essentially on the molecular level does a kidney work? Then the network features that are specific to the genes enriched for hypertension-related genes, so these positives, should be important for prioritizing hypertension-related genes. And so for every other gene in the genome, we now can have a probability that it's actually hypertension-associated that combines the genome-wise association study disease information with the kidney function information from the tissue-specific network. And that turns out to be more accurate at prioritizing known disease-associated genes for hypertension than the original GWAS, as well as known blood pressure regulatory genes and hypertensive drug targets. So throughout all of these evaluations, it's actually really important to combine the functional genomic data together with the disease signal from the GWAS associated study data uh, to be able to do much better being able to discover disease-associated genes. And this, again, is true across a number of diseases and tissue networks. And so just to conclude, I really want, hope that you guys will agree that genomic big data can actually be mined for highly specific biomedical knowledge. We need data-driven approaches, and we want to bias them minimally towards prior knowledge. Of course, we do want to use prior knowledge, but we want to bias as minimally as possible to this prior knowledge and be aware of these biases. It's critical to think about cell lineage and tissue specificity when we're thinking about complex human disease. And it's critical to combine insights and methods across different approaches, uh, computational, experimental, medical views and subfields. And if it's more critical to combine computational approaches together with clinical and experimental approaches integratively, so not as a post-processing or pre-processing step, it really should be an integrated loop to be able to get at these questions. Thank you.